Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Chatham House. Just keep an eye on the sound. I can hear a little bit of a ring on it. Um, welcome to Chatham House. I'm Robin Niblett, the director of, of the Institute. Um, it's a very great pleasure to be able to welcome you all here today. Um, this is an Africa program event that we're delighted to uh, host here at the Institute. Uh, and as you know, we're going to be discussing Somalia building stability and peace. And it really is my very great pleasure to welcome uh, the Prime Minister, His Excellency Omar Abi Rashid Ali Shamarke, uh, here to Chatham House. Um, let me just say a couple of quick things before I complete my introductions. Could you please make sure you have your mobile phone switched off? Prime Minister, I'm warning you as well, that your mobile yeah. phone, I know you're <laughs> taking calls all the time. Um, and uh, also please, as I said, uh, make sure your mobile phone is switched off. This meeting is on the record um, and we will have an opportunity here from the Prime Minister and then we will have an opportunity for question and answer uh, and we will be able to have a, a proper discussion uh, at that point. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say uh, while welcoming uh, the Prime Minister um, is that we're conscious uh, also that we have a great audience uh, here of Somalis who we've had the opportunity to work with at Chatham House. Chatham House has been working on the Horn of Africa for a good three, nearly four years now uh, under the leadership uh, of our independent expert and, and associate fellow Sally Healy uh, with the uh, support and also great contributions of Roger Middleton. So on behalf of Tom Cargill, Alex Fines and all, uh, we'd like to thank both them for the work they've been doing uh, on this area uh, and also, as I said, wanted to make a specific point uh, that the engagement we have with the Somali community here uh, in London internationally has been especially helpful. Um, uh, you're going to be contributing as much to the future of Somalia as those in Somalia will do themselves as well. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to be able to work with you um, over the coming uh, months and years. As I think most of you know, uh, the Prime Minister actually comes from a distinguished uh, political lineage, if I may say so, Prime Minister, having been uh, the son of the second president and uh, uh, first Prime Minister of Somalia. Uh, he took up his position in February uh, of this year. Uh, he was educated at uh, Carleton University in Ottawa. Um, he has his degrees in political science and political economy. Um, he has worked with the UN, diplomatic missions uh, for the UN in uh, Sri Lanka and Sierra Leone in particular, but also working as advisor on the Darfur conflict. Uh, and prior to taking his position as Prime Minister, he was the Somalian ambassador designate to the United States. Um, Prime Minister, we know that you face in your country some uh, incredibly difficult challenges uh, which are reported hugely in the news here in the UK but internationally as well. Um, we look forward to hearing your remarks. We look forward to being able to discuss the kind of ideas that we can all do to try to help you and your government uh, bring stability to your country and a stability which I think carries implications far beyond your country. We appreciate you taking the time coming to join us. We look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thanks. I think I see a lot of people that I know in the crowd. Thanks. Yeah, Director, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to be here to talk to you today. I know that a number of my fellow ministers have been made actually welcome at Chatham House in the past. It is a matter of some comfort that such a place exists where international problems, such as those facing Somalia today, can be aired and discussed. I must begin by expressing some my sincere concerns for the British couple who were missing and presumed kidnapped. I have discussed this matter with the Foreign Secretary and I want to give my assurances to the family that my government will do everything it can within its resources to find this couple and return them safely. I am confident that with a consistent level of media coverage given to Somalia, you will be familiar with the backdrop to the problems of my country. It's very likely that you will have your own perceptions of our problem and the likelihood of ever solving it. Well, I address you today with one message. The Somali government, my government, is strong, determined, and unified. We have a Somali plan, a stabilization plan for the Somali people, and we intend to implement it. This is why I am here in London this week meeting with the Foreign Secretary and why I shall be going on from here to meet other European leaders in Brussels. 
the problems of Somalia have been allowed to perpetuate for long enough. And I must tell you, as I'm telling them, that we intend to do something about it. First, let me take a few moments to update you on the current situation in Somalia generally and in Mogadishu specifically. The level of violence in Mogadishu is stable. And what I'm saying is stable, we've been attacked once every day. That is what we mean as stable in Mogadishu. It's hard to gauge the precise number of casualties, but I think good people, at least heroes, are dying every day. If we try to make a difference. Since the radical insurgents have resulted to suicide bombing, the government has taken time to structure their forces and to train where necessary. In order to flush out radicals in Mogadishu and mount a new offensive in the regions. People often say that Shawab controlled more regions in TRG. I think the interpretation of control is confused and inaccurate. People use different yardstick to measure this control. I think that radical insurgents need only to control through intimidation and violence. Whereas the TFG is only considered to be controlled when they are providing services and law and order. With the TFG, people are citizens, but with the radicals, they are tools. Traditional government have come and gone in Somalia over the last 18 years. Such is the enormity of the task. But our current president, Sheikh Sharif, and his government are bringing a renewed unity to the country. As I've recently written to your own Prime Minister, <coughs> Mr. Brown, the TFG has drafted a stabilization plan that will begin the process of restoring peace to Somalia, including Brunei and Somaliland, given support from the international community. By 2011, the TFG will eradicate piracy to civil affairs, information campaign, providing alternative livelihood, backed up by the rule of law and a selected military and law enforcement capability. <coughs> the devastation of government potential in the north will help shape the conditions for the military defeat of insurgency in the south by 2012. Piracy will eradicate by offering a sustainable business proposition to the pirates and the community they support while demonstrating that the will and capability to protect Somali waters from foreign exploitations. This carrot will be supported by the stick of new laws, credible law enforcement, and the prospect of intellectual incarceration of Somali in, Somali in the Somali prison. Our plan for defeating the insurgency is not for an open discussion, but we will succeed by using professional, disciplined Somali force, trained to respect the human rights, mindful of the need to win and maintain the support of the Somali people. Versed in Somali history, motivated by patriotic duty, and inspired to fight for the country by a vision they can believe in. The TFG has sought excellent international advice in the development of this plan and has grown more unified and more confident through the process. We firmly believe that our plan is the only chance to eradicate piracy prevent Somalia from becoming a kind of a jihadi heaven and rescuing our long suffering people and the country they still love. It has always been necessary for Somalia to demonstrate leadership and commitment to end the trust and support of the world. I'm not here to comment on the past. I'm here simply to tell you that this government is ready to lead the country out of the misery. The most important thing to appreciate is that we, the Somali people, understand our problem. We are best placed to determine the manner in which they can be solved. Overtly, the twin themes of terrorism and piracy dominate the media coverage. And that's the international perception of our country. I suspect that Jack Sparrow has actually a great deal to answer for, but even in the 21st century, piracy makes high down on the high seas and a news editor's dream. I shall turn to piracy in a moment as it is essential to our thinking, but it's the threat of insurgency and the potential for terrorism contained within it that I shall focus on first. It's well known in every culture that if government are weak or fail and leave a leadership vacuum, it will be filled by those with the energy and the desire to take over, no matter the ethics or agenda. In cases where government concedes power to radical extremism, 
for control with lethal violence and intimidation, a fact sets in that can be hard to remove. This has happened in Somalia, and as well has been a credible threat to peace and stability throughout Somalia in recent years. As we sit here today, I will describe the opposition as strong but not invisible. In the world at this time, however, radical Islamism extreme also act as a club for terrorism. And Somalia has now clearly become a heaven for a prior that is insurgency linked with Al-Qaeda. We cannot be certain of the precise size of their presence in our country, but I think Al-Qaeda is here. They are training and planning our land. Somalia is serving as an ideal place for them to regroup and to deploy. It's clear that the future of Somalia depends on the defeat of Al-Shabaab and all other radical, I think, decisions. But it is also very clear that our success in this battle is of importance to the entire world. A radical insurgency with links to Al-Qaeda are presented as a threat to the city of Somalia today. And they are starting to spread regionally in the Horn of Africa. Somalia has for decades had internal power struggle. And the most recent insurgency, Al-Shabaab, is growing in influence just like the Taliban. It is growing in a climate of economic poverty and lack of governance. Somalia has had 18 years of failure, and another generation of interesting war would destroy the fabric of society. The tribal structure that glue the country together will collapse. Two generations of illiterate children will result thousands of more refugees will inevitably become displaced. Already fragile state institutions will be so shattered that they will take decades more to be resurrected. The conflict is more at risk engulfing the region. Al-Shabaab is now starting to threaten regional stability. A policy were to become funding stream for Al-Qaeda, like in the courts for the Taliban, take over the state would be imminent. And Somalia does this be taken over by Al-Qaeda, just as Afghanistan was the heaven of Al-Qaeda was in the 1990s. Fundamentally, however, we must appreciate that extremism cannot be defeated by guns and missiles alone. Yes, great security capability is required, but it must come within a holistic regeneration plan. <clears throat> People and community currently playing host to the radical insurgency see, must see a government making progress, often a credible livelihood alternative, and leading the way to peace and prosperity. People must have confidence in the alternative, and they must see the government as providing all civil amenities and services that are currently lacking. An insurgency needs chaos, discontent, and poverty, and we must take, we must take that away. The restoration of security can succeed only with an effective rehabilitation of the nation's economy. If we are going to drive people to do something different, they must be able to see and experience that the alternative is better for them, their families, and their communities. The choice will never be simply between fighting or being dependent on the state. The choice must be fighting or working. Since the dawn of time, commercial activities and the process of improving living standards has driven society forward, and that basic premise is no different in Somalia today. I said I will return to piracy, and it's appropriate to do so now. If extremism is the dominant problem in Mogadishu and southern regions, then piracy is dominant in the central and northeast regions. But here I must correct the perceptions. Somali piracy is broadly perceived solely as a criminal activity. It's rarely seen for what it really is. A desperate survival measure, and in many coastal communities, the only job available. And the only viable means of income. I do not condone it. I want to see this end quickly. But I reflect on how humanity they treat the cruise caught in the middle, and that almost 30% of the ransom they get actually come back to the local community. The pirates, too, are acting to fill a vacuum in government and leadership. They are too responsive to the loss or disappearance of the livelihood. Many of these pirates were once fishermen and would be so again given the chance. If commerce and the construction work can lead people out of extreme in the south, a return to profitable, healthy fishing industry can lead people out of piracy in the central and north regions. I shall not name names, but suffice to say many countries are fishing illegally in Somali countries. We estimate that the value of, high of the fish being taken from our waters 
it will have hundreds of millions of dollars each year. If Holy and Occidental for this country, many of whom claim they want to help Somalia, to turn a blind eye to this debt, <coughs> particularly when that debt stops thousands of Somali people of a way out of poverty and a way out of piracy, and while the payment for international official license could be enabling my government to rebuild our country. Do you know exactly where your fish come from? Now ask yourself who is causing the problem of piracy. It is not just Somalia. We ask you act to do something about it. Support our claim to have resurrection of our rightful exclusive economic zone. Stop fleets from illegal fishing. Insist that they buy an international fishing license. Condone our rights to police our waters and respect our efforts to manage fishing in our waters sustainably. <coughs> I am fully opposed to piracy and I wish to see it end. I am willing to cope with the international community and I welcome, I think, the unprecedented international level efforts to curtail the problem. We also welcome the contract group report on regional capability development and the initiative it contains. We understand that there may be reasonable long-term solutions in the report, but we wish to see the same sense of urgency we have to tackle the cause of the problem rather than simply the symptom. The novel cooperation between the EU and NATO combined maritime forces, China, India, Japan, Malaysia, and Russia, also I may add Iran, is quite superb. An example of what can be achieved when the international community faces a common threat. It is also a really clear indication of just how important these issues to the Western world. We ask the international community to remember that the novel presence of the coast of Somalia is a very expensive commitment. And to realize that the cost of this commitment over the two years is, is probably ten times as much as is needed to implement our plan for the situation of peace and stability within the same period. On every count, it is the Somali people themselves who can and must solve these problems. It's not the EU, UN, EU, African Union, the American or the British in isolation. It's we, the Somali people, who will win back Somalia. We must take us with to this tag, and we do. We welcome cooperation with AMPAS, and want to work more closely with them to integrate our thinking and develop an exceeding and sustainable solution that will not entail years of open-ended UN resources and commitment. The TFG had a group great confidence in our plans for security, stability and justice in Somalia by 2012. We can only succeed in its implementation with the support of international community. It is you that we turn for trust, expertise and investment. We do not wish our people to continue to pose a threat to the world's most essential trading and shipping route. And we most certainly do not want to foster extremism and exoterrorism fighters to cause fear and mayhem around the world. Neither do we want to be policed from afar by people too distant from our situation. I assure you that the cost of policing us will be vastly more in the long run than the investment we believe can launch the process of recovery of this planet. In my lifetime, Somalia has been a thriving commercial center with beautiful cities, a strong culture and a stable economy. Tourists even came to Somalia on holiday. We, the people of Somalia, want that back again. We have a country wealthy in resources and opportunities that can be used to restore peace and prosperity to this troubled land. We have a political unity and will and a confident administration ready to face these challenges. We do not want years of charity. We do not seek donations. We seek investors. People, corporations, or government ready to play a crucial role in the restoration of our country and the restoration of the economy that attracts our people into work, gives them hope and gives them future. We expect to give a good return to our investors. The time to act is now. Each day we do nothing, the resurgence grows stronger, the tourist trade increases, and the cost of shipping on world trade will increase. The government of a country is unified, determined, and strong. We understand our problems and how they impact on the wider world. We appreciate the help and support we are receiving, but now we have a Somali stabilization plan for the people of Somalia, and we are asking for a short-term investment to implement it. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Thank you for those remarks. Uh, I take away, I think, a number of, of important points from your comments here. Number one, you commented right at the beginning about the extreme level of violence that continues to operate not only in your country, but obviously is also affecting directly what your government can and cannot do uh, on a daily basis. And the arrival, as you said, of suicide bombings is one of the features is especially troubling and worrying in that sense. You mentioned, secondly, some comments about al-Shabaab and, and the definition of control, who controls what. Uh, and I noticed your comment that their ability to control is one based on violence that a small number of people can do, and the government's ability for control is something that requires uh, really an integrated approach that is far more complex to, to sustain. Um, you also noted uh, the concerns about the regional ambitions of al-Shabaab and al-Qaeda in the region. That's something we might come back to in terms of the questions it draws in Yemen and other countries as well. Um, you talked quite a bit about development uh, and the development plans that your government has for the country. And I think uh, the way I took it, your, your reference to piracy, which as you said, you do not want to have dominate the entire uh, debate about Somalia. Um, but you did put it in a very different context, which is the context as well of the huge uh, amount of illegal fishing that goes on off the coast of your country, and I might add around large parts of the African continent as a whole. In fact, I chaired uh, a meeting here at Chatham House just two weeks ago on illegal fishing, focusing in particular, in fact, on West Africa, where we've seen the drugs uh, and drug running coming in as an alternative to fishing. In your case, uh, it's piracy. Um, and then I think your final comment, um, that you don't want to be policed uh, from afar from people who don't understand the situation in a way there may be a better way for us to invest our resources in how we help you and we need to be thoughtful about the kind of support we're giving and not treat this as a, as a problem we try to stick our thumb into but one that we have an integrated approach to with you. In any case, there are many other good points in your remarks but I just wanted to draw those out. Maybe they'll serve for some of the discussion that we can have now. Uh, we have a good half an hour for questions. Uh, if you could please uh, let us know who you are when you pose a question. Try and keep it short and make it a question rather than a, uh, a treatise or a comment. Uh, there are microphones around the room which will be brought to you. Um, but who would like to uh, come in first and take a first question? I see one here, then I have two questions there. But the gentleman here first. Sorry, the back row with the glasses. Back row. No, come forward. There you go. I'll get you started. Please. Michael Walls from Development Planning Unit at UCL. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that the TFG has plans to restore peace to Somalia, including Puntland and Somaliland. What are your, the transitional government's plans for Somaliland? Uh, as you might know, Somaliland has been going through a little bit of uh, difficulties over the postponement of elections. I think we are planning, I think, willing to sit with them after they actually go through that elections and see how best open a dialogue with Somalia and see how best Somalia could be decided its own destiny. I think we are very optimistic that actually Somalia's I think life, political, as well as security situation are intertwined. You might be surprised if I tell you that the top two leaders of the al shabaab in Somalia come from Somalia. I think Somali everywhere have a really kind of a, an intertwined life. Thank you very much. Please, thank you. Uh, Frank Gardner, BBC security correspondent. Um, I wonder if you could tell us your attitude to the use of US targeted military intervention in your country. I'm talking here particularly about the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, the recent targeting of a suspected Al-Qaeda leader. Is this something which your government requests from the Americans? Is it something that they force on you, or is it something that you just tolerate? I think the American kind of surveillance of Al-Qaeda actually has been ongoing before my government came to power. And I think that actually the problem is not what the Americans are kind of in going after. The problem is the people who decided, who are wanted to out the world, decided to come to Somalia for a safe haven. I think we welcome for the, for the actions that was taken against in people uh, who were suspected 
behind the moments of the American embassy in Kenya. I didn't welcome any action that can take out such individuals who are hiding in Somalia. So, for here first. I'm coming here, then I've got two questions there. Yeah. Ahmed Shaibani from Libya, an official spokesperson to Al Jamar Media Center. I have a very romantic view of Somalia, and sometimes I wonder in my head what curse has hit uh, Somalia. In the early 70s, my father was the Libyan ambassador to Somalia, and I remember I used to go to school and I used to sing every day, Abi Garashada Gaye Gayogo Muhammadi Siad. But I have um, one question. I did not hear your point when you said uh, your uh, treasury is missing out on hundreds of, hundreds of millions every year. I, I could not hear this as a result of what. Do you think there is a, now there is an opportunity where at Somalia could strike a deal with Ethiopia to give them access to a, a harbor so you can have legitimate transparent income and this would lend you more stability and security in the region? And my second point, if you would allow me, Your Excellency, is I, I beg to differ as far as Al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda in Arabic, it means the base, like the military base. And it is an illusion to think that a military base suddenly has sprung up in Yemen or in, uh, in Somalia. It is an ideology. It, it functions on the Internet. Yes, there is, there is seepage of ideology in Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Somalia, but the key question is, as w with your title, Building Stability, my opinion, I feel you need to tackle it at grassroots level, which is education. What's your plans to invest in education to tackle radicalism, specifically Wahhabism or Salafism? Because we in Libya, we have hired Sufi scholars to bring more moderate romantic version of Islam similar to the former Soviet Union Islamic countries like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Azerbaijan, even Turkey. Thank you. Yes, two uh, good questions, I think. Yeah. I think I agree with you that actually you cannot confront with such guns and missiles with, with a kind of a, in the ideology in which the belief of these guys. And yes, we are kind of a, in putting together in the so-called alumnus, scholars, language scholars, that would confront these guys with, with the real interpretation of Islam. And what was the second? The, the, just but one additional bit on that, and I'll give you the first question, yeah. but uh, the view that can Al-Qaeda really create a base in, in Somalia, what's your view on that? No, no, it's not the base. Actually, it's a kind of an ideology, as you said, that actually recruits right. people there are some other people on the ground. Yes, they have affiliates. And I think that was evident of the killing of the fellow who was claimed to be behind the bombing of US Embassy in Kenya. And I do believe that some other key individuals are hiding in Somalia. The other question was whether this is time to be able to do a deal with Ethiopia on a harbor, something that would help both uh, provide additional revenue for your government uh, and obviously would be of interest to Ethiopia as well. Yeah, actually, the part that you didn't hear was that illegal fishing was causing us kind of a hundred million loss of money that actually could have enabled us to restore business stability in the country. And the second thing is actually you're providing harbor to Ethiopia. I think they're already using the better port for, for uh, and I think they might also use other ports. It depends on kind of a negotiation terms we as a government and the Ethiopian government would willing to negotiate. But I think we are, as I said in my speech, I think we seek investment, definitely, not only charity and donations. I think Somalia is rich in terms of resources. I think we only need kind of a, in, I think the kind of support that will restore peace and stability in, in, in Somalia. Thank you. First, I've got a question here. Then I have two gentlemen there, then one there. I'm, I'm moving around this way. Gentleman here first. Uh, thank you very much for coming to London. And uh, my name is Hassan Haji Ibrahim. I'm a member of Somali Parliament, who happen to be here today. Uh, I have uh, some. Um, the first of 
uh, of all, I have uh, really impressed the first African leader saying no donation and charities to, you know, uh, to, to his country and preferring investment, which is really, really very good point. But the, the, the first thing that I wanted is just this. You've mentioned many things, including illegal fishing, even though just, you know, uh, it slipped your mind for toxic dumping. But what I, uh, my question is, there is, uh, in East Africa, there is a war and drought, there is no water and, you know, long famine. And many East African countries, including Ethiopia and Kenya, already just, they ask it, how, you know, uh, international help. Uh, in your case, if you've asked, we know just that the country just, you know, uh, uh, the government has lack of control, the, the must, you know, uh, the problematic area. If you've asked it, what mechanism you intend to deliver those food and aid and medicine for those people, for needy people? Thank you. I think, yes, I have raised this issue of droughts and, and, and I think you're telling kind of a situation that is very disturbing. Sorry to the foreign secretary and actually the British officials I read yesterday. And I think Somalia is formally, it's not endowment. It's actually political issues. And I think if we tackle the political, I think, and um, answer to it, I think Somalia has had droughts, I mean, in so many years, I think we were able to overcome those challenges. But what has actually exacerbated the situation is actually the present situation we find in ourselves in. So I think, yes, we need to tackle these thoughts that have created much more kind of a complication. It's already very kind of a in a humanitarian and disturbing situation. But I think we need to, in, that's why I was focusing more on the kind of a political aspect of, of the historical peace and stability in Somalia. And I think some of the questions as well, they were about infrastructure in particular. Um, the problems of famine, water, how do you deliver, you know, how do you start to spread the writ of the government, the control of the government more broadly and get basic services out? What sort of support do you need in those areas? How does mm -hmm. that play out? Mm -hmm. I think actually our aim was, I think since the beginning of, since the session of this government, to first get the minimum space to deliver at least basic services and then expand gradually. I think it's because I'm here that I'm seeking support for our capacity to push and deliver further into the regions. I think we have a plan that actually would definitely seek, I mean, a uh, regional plan where by we're, we're trying to, you know, in set up in our set of structures in the regions. And I think that will help actually in the deliverance of, of, of this humanitarian situation. Thank you. First, I'm sorry, I've got some questions here first. First you, sir, and then the person next to you, and then I'm moving around here. <laughs> There's a lot of hands going up now. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ali Ahmed. Um, I am from Somalia, political party for Hanorato. And my question to the minister is, uh, basically you've expressed your concern about Chatteris families and, you know, the, the virus holding in Somali seas, which is, I completely agree with you, slide. But what we haven't seen, you and your colleagues, is that the violence is going on in Somalia and that you've mentioned, particularly those that are committed by Amazon, late this morning, 22nd of, of October, where 60 innocent killed by Bukhara market. And none of you, you and your colleagues, have said anything about it. And why that is the case? And also, who who basically, the Amazon, who they get the order from you, from their government, or from whatever? Can you just comment on that? Yeah. Actually, it's Amazon is there to support the government. So, sorry, just the African Union mission, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah Amazon is the African Union. Amazon is there to support the government. I think at times that Amazon has caused some collateral damages, I think we express our condolences, express our dissatisfaction or such kind of, a, in, in, you know, casualties. We did, I think the Minister of Information spoke about this issue in, when this happened. But keep in mind that in recent days, the citizens who were going to the mosques actually saying to, to, to Somalis that they're going to start throwing in, uh, throwing shelling coming from in markets and that people should not kind of a come against such initiative. In not only that, 
they, I think, well known that they have started even shelling the Bukhara market just to turn kind of people against Amazon or against the government. Actually, we have discussed with Amazon that they should refrain, I mean, themselves on any kind of a collateral, anything that can do collateral damage. I think we are very sorry that actually in anything that Amazon did has caused casualties, but I think it was never the aim of our government to harm our people. It's never the aim of Amazon. Amazon is not there to harm someone else. It was there because when I it's going to ask some resolution and, and EU resolution to assist the government. So anything that happened actually I asked the Minister of Information to talk about and I think they did. Right, sorry, the question, person next door, uh, and I'm coming around to the side of the room in a minute. Sarah Jama, British Somali, living in London. Um, my question is a different flavor. It's actually on the Constitution. Would the Prime Minister demystify the Americanness between the TFG Charter in relation to TFG, the Puntland constitutional power? And by that I mean, where the Bundesland, Somaliland in that, in that regard, has the constitutional power within the Charter of the TFG to actually go in and have an agreement with an international gov with, with sovereign government, or more importantly, more powerful in entities like um, oil companies. Hmm. <laughs> you know, I tell you, <laughs> international agreement is, I think, way through the federal government. And, and as a federal government, I think, we have a responsibility to seek development in areas we seek, in areas we think are stable. We're not going to, we're not going to kind of uh, in prevent any kind of development activities that will take place even in Somalia or Finland. Definitely we'll, we'll encourage, we're willing to sign agreements on behalf of that, but I think international agreements and international contracts should go through the federal government. It's a straight answer. <laughs> um, first in the corner here, the gentleman here. Yeah. I'll take, take some questions here. Yeah. Rudy Grazi, a member of Chatham House. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I would like, if I may, to shift your subject from Africa to Europe. Uh, Kosovo has been recognized by 62 UN member states, including the United States, the vast majority of the European Union, and Saudi Arabia. When your government is considering uh, recognizing Kosovo and hence uh, <laughs> strengthening the peace and security <laughs> in Europe. You get all sorts of questions to Chatham House. This is, uh, we're going to take you off your comfort zone here. You know, we are really uh, seeking good bilateral relations for all the countries. And I think I welcome, uh, in, for the, I accept and welcome the kind of uh, the will of the people. And, and I, I really support that. Okay, um, I have a lot of questions. I may be getting to you, hopefully, I may have to take some in a group premise, if that's all right. We've got 15 minutes, but I can see we're going to run out of time. A uh, person has been waiting very patiently, so it was you, sir, exactly. No, this gentleman standing up now. Yeah. And then I'll read these three questions. Thank, thank you so much. For, I meet you in a, in a Mogadishu in September, and I can sense for you uh, the challenge you face in your government. Um, my question is, uh, there's a lot of uh, promise for international community to support you for your government, but it still seems to me that they're not actually uh, uh, fearful for their promise. What is obstacle you think international community actually not supporting for the Somali government and as such? What exactly you think why they actually hesitate to international community? They, um, there was a Brussels meeting for a few months ago when, when your government has been established <coughs> and the pledge about uh, millions of um, uh, uh, you know, support and it didn't materialize. What exactly holding for those support? That's my question. If you could put, just pass the microphone to, to that person there. It's just, if that's right, so I'll take a little group of questions. I'll keep note yeah. of that as well. If you okay. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Abdelaziz Ali Ibrahim, uh, known as Fildivan. I've been living here in, in, in London since 2001, and, uh, and, and I'm author of the different books um, and I would like to ask the, the Prime Minister, is it true, Mr. Prime Minister, that the members of your government or otherwise 
former members of the Somali government and mem or former Somali warlords has given access to the companies and the and companies and uh, and the government government is illegally fishing the Somali waters. Though I understand the actions then of the pirates cannot be justified by any means. That that's my question, sir. Thank you. Okay, and then one more question here in front. We'll come. We'll take another group back there. I've got. I think I've got everyone's hands. Yes, I've got you, sir. Um, thank you very much. Um, notwithstanding that, um, there was questions of the legitimacy of your government for the start. Um, and it still lacks the legitimacy from its people. And however, it has, a, it has a mandate which says that it paves the way to, to a democratically elected government and it does the reconciliation of, uh, from the outset of what Somalis follow. Uh, can you tell us what achievements have you made thus far? And my other question is incorporated with we, that we, one of quick, Frank quickly, Gana, because we've got a lot quickly, here. Frank Garner and, and, and the guy from the uh, UCL. Uh, first, are you benefiting from um, the political crisis in Somaliland so that you um, or you have any vision that makes you um, 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 to, to make a unified Somali uh, institute. And the other one is um, uh, Unison always shells to Bakara and, and, uh, and the other markets where there is a popular people. And we always hear one of your ministries apologetic out of that and it doesn't stop. So, uh, how does that work systematically? Thank you. So, let's just stop that group there. Then I'm taking some questions back on this side and a lot of hands there. I have those, uh, did you have those questions or do you want me to? Yeah, ask? I think I have. First was international then, support in particular. Yeah. Where is it? Um, yeah. Where is the international support that was offered to your government at the beginning when it was first launched? Actually, one of the reasons I came here is actually to follow on the support pledged in Brussels. Um, I think Speak towards them, that's good. You're talking in between them. Okay. I think there's two I think problems for the support. One I think is because of image. The image left by our predecessors and that perhaps some of the traditional comments came and gone. And I think we are trying to say that we are a different set of people and that international community, you know, the cost of doing nothing is far greater than the cost of assessing the government. So, I'm pushing for that. I think some funds have come forth and, and we appreciate for the countries who have actually in, put forth what they have pledged, but definitely we are following, I know, we are very optimistic that things will come forth. And the second question was the legitimacy. The fishing issue, Kimberly's fishing, I think. Yeah, I, will, I don't know whether the, this uh, fishing issue is before our government has actually occurred to. To my knowledge, I think we haven't uh, actually issued any fishing license since we came. Actually, one of the reasons I'm going to Brussels in, uh, tomorrow is to discuss these issues. I think to have the naval force that actually now are guarding and, and protecting in the truth trade to also have a mandate to protect our exclusive economic zone. I think we want to seek an agreement with the EU to protect until our coast guards will be ready to actually protect its own economic exclusive zone. And then was the legitimacy. legitimacy. The what have you achieved in that sense for the legitimacy? I think I have not doubt that the, this government is legitimate. However, we must gain, I think, and expand our legitimacy by providing services. Not only providing kind of a security and law enforcement, but also providing services. I think the capacity of the government to do so is very low. And one of the reasons actually I came here is to face that sense of urgency for us to deliver these basic services. I'm sure that people, we have the support of the Somali population, yes, 
there are people who are questioning why we are not have come, you know, to the reach to their own villages thus far. But I think the plan we have actually developed as far as this reaching throughout the country within the next two years, inshallah. And then the last question is whether you are benefiting from the Somaliland crisis in any particular way. No, we're not benefiting from the Somaliland crisis. I think we wish to see a stable Somaliland. Really. I think Somaliland has set examples of stability, at least better governance, and we wish to see, as I said on the radio, actually one of the, uh, when the crisis was a little bit tense, that we wish to see a very stable Somaliland. I think we will open a dialogue after elections, and, and we wish to see that things you know, go through smoothly. I'm now going to take a set of questions up here. I won't be able to get to everyone. Uh, we'll do our best here, but we have a lot of questions. First, the gentleman waiting here. And then I'm going right to the back of the room. The lady's been waiting for patiently, and then we've got two people there, the person here. Hello. Uh, my here. name's Hello. Martin Grigsoni from a British company called Cohorts at LLP. We deal with international investment. It follows on somewhat from the question that was put down here about the differences between TFG, Somaliland, Puntland. Uh, we already have a sister company working in Somaliland, dealing with the Coast Guard there. So I agree with Your Excellency about putting some sort of Coast Guard out to get the fisheries, to get the money in, to start the whole thing rolling. The challenge we have when we deal with the Buntlander diaspora uh, is some of the difficulties between those two sides. And then getting the support of the, uh, the TFG perhaps as a whole to then get investment in, and that's perhaps my question to you, where you say you don't want charity coming in, in all our experiences dealing with the European Union, and even the Swedish lady that came to Puntland, she said the money must come from the UN, and it's only by getting that support centrally, uh, which we would hope to get from your Excellency and your government, to spread that security along, that that's the challenge, and even if we deal with the Foreign Office, sometimes it's we have to deal with Somalia as a whole, not the difficulties. So one specific question would be, do you see Somaliland seeking and getting independence? Uh, and how much can you give support to international business coming in uh, in the way that I've just described? Thank you. <laughs> Why don't you take that one quickly, then I'm going to group the lot at the, the end. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've got two more groups, one here and one there. We'll have time. Yeah, okay. I think for the first question, I don't believe in Somalia is willing to do. I must be honest, I believe in one Somalia. I believe in the unity of Somalia. Yes, we might have kind of a federal system that actually accommodates local identities and, and so on. But I think a split of Somalia into two will not serve any purpose. I think our lives, our economic and political as well as security kind of lives are intertwined. I think we have different, different kind of uh, differences in, in, in the distance of, the, of Somalia. But I think in the law government, most Somalis will realize that while the entire world is coming together to form kind of a union, why are we splitting? And definitely, we encourage economic activities, both in Somalia and from that. I think, yes, the TFG must be involved as a holistic, as a national kind of a, but definitely if there's any economic activities going in Somalia, we're willing to really support that and encourage that. Good. Now, the lady at the back first, right at the back. Put her hand up. I'll take a group of questions if that's all right. Yeah, so okay. I'll keep track of them here. I'm going to get like, five questions in here. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, Louisa Brooke with BBC Analysis Research. Um, just on Amazon again, I was just wondering if you think the current number of troops on the force is adequate. Um, and also, do you think that al Shabaab's threats that you mentioned before to Burundi and Uganda recently, uh, if they will hamper further efforts to get further contributions from those two countries or from other countries to Amazon. Thank you. So the first one, Amazon. Yes, I'll keep it as an Amazon and whether there's enough troops. Then the two years active, the two gentlemen there with white shirts on, I think. Good afternoon. Dominic Helling from the Crisis Aid Research Center at the London School of Economics. Mr. President, earlier on this year, the government, the TFG, missed out on the opportunity of reaching out to the more extremist elements in January and February. Now that certain fractions are appearing within and between different radical elements, there seems to be a second window of opportunity to reach out. Therefore, my question, what are the TFG's concrete plans and actions to profit from that situation? Thank you. Uh, 
how to take advantage of it. Person next to you. Thank you. Uh, George Grant, the Henry Jackson Society. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Prime Minister, yours is the 15th administration since uh, 1991. And with the very greatest of respect, I think one of the major criticisms um, has been in Somalia that there has been too much emphasis, proportionally speaking, on building a state apparatus from above um, and perhaps insufficient effort being paid to building uh, grassroots coalitions and, and support of, of the people below. And I'd like to ask you, what uh, is your government doing to support uh, grassroots movements in South and Central Somalia and, uh, and what more can be done in that regard? I do. I'm, I'm going to fit two more in. I'm not going to be able to satisfy everyone, but the two people I have first, just the gentleman here and the person there. So we'll go here and then we'll finish with you, sir. Sorry to everyone else. Thank you. Uh, Mehmet Hassan from Turkish Daily Market Newspaper. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, my question is, um, who do you think supply arms for Al-Shahab organization and the pirates? Thank you. Easy. Get the easy questions at the end. And the last question is the gentleman waiting there. Um, Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, to be with us today as a Somali diaspora living here in Britain. And I know many journalists that are here today are talking about the piracy and the terrorism of Somalia. But the death toll of Somalia is rising every day. On, on the last Thursday, more than 60 people have died in Mogadishu and nothing has been done in your government. And even it didn't talk. And really, as a Somali diaspora, we are very, very concerned about that. Another thing is I want to say is your government able to get the minds and hearts for the Somali people because many of the Somali people do not trust your government because it is look like this government is being you know operating from foreign hands and uh, as I as I believe as a Somalian we should international community let the Somali people to get solution their country and to share the value for uh, peace and stability for all another thing I would like your government didn't mention 19,000 people who have died in Mogadishu during the invasion of Ethiopia. And really, you have blamed that the Eritrea are supporting to the Al-Shabaab or other parts. Why it's happened that? Thank you. Okay. There's about five questions there. There yeah. are five that I've got. Amistad, there enough troops is the first one, maybe. Let's see if we can get these. Yeah. How much time do you have, Prime Minister? I think the budget force of Amazon is supposed to be 8,000. I think we have at least 5,000 on the ground now, and, and we might have additional battalions in the coming months. However, I think with the current kind of a in force level, I think they were able to at least kind of a protect key institutions that they were assigned to protect. I think the solution doesn't lie on on, on only arms or foreign forces. The solution lies on our own national security, mm. lies on our own political kind of a in willingness to to reconcile. And I think we are doing that. We are trying to train our forces. Amazon is only confined to Mogadishu, and you cannot actually you cannot kind of a do much about it if you concentrate only on Mogadishu. That's why we are building our own national security force to actually spread and expand throughout the country. The second question was on uh, being able to take advantage of the fractures between the radical groups of the TFG, what they're doing to take advantage of that. Actually, the recent crisis between his Islam and Al-Shaab provided both, both, I think, opportunity and challenges. Challenges in terms of because the fighting has actually created more IDPs and a lot of people actually are fleeing when his Islam and, 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 and Shabaab coincide. Opportunities, yes, I think since that clashes, many of the commanders as well as the armed forces came and joined the government. And we're taking advantage not because of the clashes, but we're trying to reconcile, I think, some of those moderate ones. You know, we have to keep in mind that actually in, uh, in Hesasan and, and Shawab, particularly, they kind of uh, have a key three different categories. I think a group who's mostly ideologue that are on the core doctrine and those who have gone there for political opportunities and the last but not least group who is there for economic opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think we're trying to discuss and we have still keeping open channels with those who have a political agenda 
with those who sought having to join this insurgency because of a canal of opportunities. But I think those who have been the doctrine of this organization, I think, have an agenda beyond our borders. That's why we are not Kanawa. Have no chance to sit with them because their plan is not actually to. It's just, you know, it's a regional and I think beyond regional plans. The other question was whether there's too much emphasis on building state apparatus from above and not enough from the ground up. Well, I think we have started uh, for planning for the peace. I think we know that in radicalism actually it grows in a vacuum. Mm. And to counter that, actually, we have, I have gone to the regions and I was very much encouraged actually that most of the people in the regions are ready to have some sort of unsafe infrastructures. I think it's a matter of time that we will send our ministers, I think whom I have, I suppose, to actually introduce Minister of Planning and International Cooperation at Han, and also in, and, and Minister of uh, Telecommunication at Han and Sabdin. <laughs> actually, I had also Minister of Security with me, but he could not be here today. Uh, the thing is, we send in our ministers, our parliamentarians to the regions for the sole purpose of actually helping grassroots to set up and see structures at the district and regional levels. I think this would help kind of stabilize the central regions as well as Iran and other parts of Somalia. So, yeah. Who is supplying the arms, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to take that question. <laughs> I think um, the monitoring group on the arms of Marco have identified actually Eritrea being involved in violating the arms embargo. I think Eritrea was the only country that was made mention in that report. And then the last question I think is one maybe you might want to wrap up on, which is this issue uh, that came at the end about the people who are dying uh, both in the past under the Ethiopian invasion and, and the kind of amounts are dying today. Maybe that will give you a chance to make a final comment before we break up. Actually, so many people have died and I think it's, uh, it's very sad, really. it's very sad situation that so many Somalis, so many good people, you know, died either because of the invasion or are dying because of the continuous violence that actually have engulfed Somalia. We do not condone any violence against Somali people. We are against it. We have faced that in uh, consent. I think what Amazon, one thing was clear. Amazon is not, is not there to shell Somalis. If they did some damage and collateral cost casualties, we have raised this concern privately with them and also we express our kind of a regret to the radio. I think it's very sad. We are discussing with Amazon, but I think the solution doesn't lie. I think the solution lies on that to prevent these guys to throw any shells within the condition. And inshallah, the government has a plan actually to flash out insurgency out of Mogadishu. For the issue of legitimacy, I don't know, perhaps, I mean, you said that the, the government doesn't have legitimacy. I think I've been to the regions, and everywhere I went, actually, people supported this government. I think <coughs> this government remained unified, remained determined, and remained strong to solve, I think, the problems we're confronted with. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for all those remarks. I'm very sorry to all of those of you who had questions up. There's at least 10 people who want to ask questions. I think this confirms, obviously, the great interest in what's happening in Somalia, the diaspora community here that are interested, but also as we've seen from questions from students, journalists, academics, uh, business people, uh, what is happening in Somalia is of great interest, well beyond your shores as well. And hopefully we can integrate that international interest with the domestic agenda you're trying to take. Before I ask you to thank the Prime Minister's remarks, can I ask you to please remain in your seats while the Prime Minister steps out, because he has another meeting that he's running late for now, a little bit, having gone over time. Um, so please stay in your seats. But when we do so, Prime Minister, we hope we can welcome you back to Chatham House. Good luck with your work. I think Sally Healy, Roger, Middleton and others look forward to carrying on working with you and with others working here in London and elsewhere on your country. Best of luck and thank you very much.